by the way, this is page 323, 324 of my notes. <laughs> and that's note form. That's, you know, verse scratched off here, a little sentence there. <laughs> Acts chapter 28. I'm going to read from verse 25 down. We talked about the difference between verse 25 and verse 29 last time, the difference between uh, one word and these words, and we won't repeat that, but I'll just bring it to your attention in case that'll spike your curiosity. Uh, but we just really have the two concluding verses, verses 30 and 31 to look at today. And, uh, and so just for context, I'll start in verse 25. It says, and when they agreed, and that's the Jews that Paul had just preached to in Rome, uh, and trying to prove to them that Jesus is the Christ. It says, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For heart, the heart of this people is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So that's a real exciting conclusion to the book there, as Paul is left bound, and yet has great opportunity and great protection, as you read in those last two verses. Uh, in verse 29, when the Jews departed from him, and that's in verses 28 and 29, really is the, uh, the point of the book of Acts, uh, the, the indictment against Israel in verses 20, 25 through 27, that they're left blinded, cut off from God. And then, well, what has happened with Israel cut off from God? Well, verse 28, God has turned to the Gentiles. The salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. And the fact that at this point in history, the Gentiles were willing to hear it. And, and so the opportunity is now, by God's grace, going to the Gentiles. When it says in verse 29, And when, they, when he had said these things, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. The great reasoning is not only did they have to go over all the things Paul said that proved who Jesus is, that he was indeed the Christ and they missed him and crucified him, but then this statement about them left blinded and God turning to the Gentiles, I mean... That, that's going to require great reasoning. Not only reasoning from the Scripture, but that's not, that's not found in the Scriptures. That's part of what the Bible calls the unsearchable riches of Christ. Because the fact is, is that when Israel got to the point where they wouldn't hear God, and they were in the state that Isaiah said they were in, when we read the book of Isaiah, that's when the tribulation, the wrath, was going to be poured out. But rather than wrath being poured out at this point with Israel in that blinded state and not God not converting them at this point, not healing them at this point, that instead of wrath falling, God, salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. And that's, that's something they can't understand. That's only a revelation they could get from Paul. And that leaves you to study the next 13 books of your Bible, uh, the, the epistles of Paul, where... Um, where he explains what, what's happening in the age of grace and what the doctrine is for the Gentiles. Um, so they had great reasoning among themselves, and, and they didn't have a little bit of reasoning. <laughs> they had great reasoning. They had a lot to think about, but they leave Paul and, and go off to think about that. In verse 30, you're left now with the fact that Paul's dwelling two whole years in his own hired house. He's under house arrest. He is arrested. He's there as a prisoner in Rome. But he has some great liberty. He, he has at least one uh, guard that's perhaps, well, must be bound to him because it says over there in verse 20, it says, for, uh, for this cause, therefore, have I called unto you to see you that I might speak unto you, that because for the hope of Israel am I bound with this chain. And 
and his arrest had to do with his, his ministry and some things he said to Israel, but the point there is bound with this chain. So he is under house arrest, and he does have some kind of chain on him, but he's got two whole years to dwell in his own hired house, where he, it says, uh, and, and received all that came in unto him. So that when you see Paul arrested here, he's left uh, with, with this, able to have hospitality, able to have people over his house. And so I've entitled just these last two verses, is Paul left bound at Rome, but the word of God is not bound. And by the way, that is a verse of scripture. Hold your place here, Philipp uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it's not the context of 2 Timothy 2 that I want to show you. It's verse 9, but I will read a little bit out of the context there. In some weeks to come, we'll see some of the association of these other books in the Bible as it compared to, to our study in the book of Acts. But, but here Paul says in verse 7 of 2 Timothy 2, it says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And that is in contrast to Jesus Christ who is the seed of David being raised from the dead according to Israel's gospel. That would have been the Messiah of Israel, the one who's going to come and sit on the throne of David and reign. But Paul says he's, raised, he's the seed of David raised from the dead according to my gospel, the, the, the ministry to the Gentiles, the age of grace. So that's why he says, consider what I say and the Lord give you understanding. But verse 9 says, wherein, according, uh, where he just talked about raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I, have, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. And that's where we're leaving him in the book of Acts, bound. He, this might be a second binding as, as we look at the, later on about some things in 1st 2nd Timothy. But, but here he's, he, he says that he's suffering even as an evildoer. He's not an evildoer, but he's bound as, along with other prisoners. He says, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And so he endures all things for the elect's sake. And the things that he's enduring is being in bonds as an evildoer. But even when he's in bonds as an evildoer, he said, the word of God's not bound. <laughs> and that's, that's a testimony of the end of the book of Acts. He's bound, you know, he's at, it chained. He's got some liberty there in Rome as a prisoner, uh, but he's receiving all that come to him. And as a result of that, they come in, learn the word of God, and take it out beyond him. And... Uh, and that's how the Word of God is going out ever since the end of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. His ministry, the things he writes, are committed to us in his epistles. And though he's long gone, we continue to spread the message as ambassadors of Christ, uh, of God's message for the world as long as God continues to dispense his grace. So he's bound, but the Word of God is not bound. Uh, you probably are familiar with this, but on the way back, stop at Philippians and remember our study in the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Paul says in Philippians 1 and verse 12, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ, see he's got chains on him there, so he's bound as a prisoner, are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So the, Paul might be bound, but the word of God is not bound. And he says it's actually causing the gospel to spread because people are becoming emboldened where Paul can't go share the gospel, so they'll go out and share the gospel. And, and so the word of God is not bound. So uh, with that, go back to Acts chapter 28. When you consider how these last two verses... Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this last statement. With all confidence, no man forbidding him. 
what a nice way. And, you know, it, it, in one sense, you, you, know, you, you feel bad about Paul being left bound. But when you consider the, the liberty that he has here, that he might be under house arrest, but what opportunities he has. It, it's unlimited there as, as far as access to him. Uh, but he has great liberty. He has opportunity. He actually has protection from the Roman government. No man forbidding him. Paul hadn't had it that good all the way through the book of Acts. All of our studies in the book of Acts is when Paul went anywhere, sometimes he was stoned, sometimes he was jailed, sometimes he was run out of town. There was always riots against him. Sometimes it was Jews. Sometimes the Jews would stir up the Gentiles. I mean, he had it, he had it bad everywhere he went. All of a sudden we conclude the book with the most protection, most liberty that we've seen in the book of Acts. There he is, no man forbidding him. He can do, say what he wants, have, receive who he wants, and, and so he conducts a ministry from there. And that, that opportunity, according to verse 30, lasts for two whole years. Now I know our court system is slow, and apparently the Roman court system was pretty slow too. He's appealed to Caesar. He's waiting for his time to address his case before Caesar. And apparently those first two years he hadn't yet been to Caesar, and, and he just has this kind of liberty, receiving all that come unto him. So he's going to practice hospitality in a rented home or a home that's been provided for him to stay in. Uh, certainly, if he's receiving all that come unto him, then he's having some kind of home Bible studies. He is, uh, uh, got, I don't know if he actually would form a home church. There's already, we've talked about uh, three or four different uh, assemblies that are already uh, there in Rome, so whether he would conflict with them or not by having a home church, but he certainly would have home Bible studies. If he receives all who come unto him, well, they're certainly the locals. I mean, if you lived in Rome and you wanted to know, well, what is God's message for us, and you had access to this, the apostle to the Gentiles, so the, the locals could come to him and, 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 and he received all who would come. And then there certainly would be travelers who would always be coming through Rome and hear about Paul being there. He had opportunity to share with them and they take the message out with them. Even those that are the curious, maybe they're not coming as a believer to study, they just want to find out what he's got to say. I say that because he's preaching and teaching in those last, in that verse 31. So he has the opportunity to do some even evangelism in that place. So those who are curious are stopping to see him. And certainly the, the, the messengers of the churches. That is, you read in, in the different epistles about someone who was sent to Paul at Rome. Sometimes they would carry supplies, like the, uh, when you read in the Philippians that they brought him uh, some gifts, some financial or maybe even some clothing and things like that. There's people coming from different churches to him, and he sends those people back with epistles, and that's how the prison epistles get delivered. Would Barnabas and Silva fit into that? Yeah, he certainly does. Yeah, we're going to, in our studies, we have already uh, shown about where six different books are written already in the Acts period. But we also want to look at the other books that Paul wrote that are outside the Acts period, and that's in future studies. I'm not, that's why I said it. in the next couple of weeks, I don't think I want to start something that heavy. Uh, whether I do next week or not, I, I don't know. But anyhow, that's some of the things that we'll be looking at so that we're familiar with all the rest of his epistles as well. But that the whole point here, receiving all that, uh, that come to him, certainly those messengers from the churches and him carrying, them carrying back epistles that he's writing, whether in the first two years or after, that's an interesting study of when those prison epistles, and I'm not sure I can actually definitively tell you when those prison epistles are written, uh, but it's interesting to consider the whole two years. That's a lot of liberty, a lot of time. But anyhow, that's, that's what he's undergoing here. Then in verse 31, in that time that he has receiving all that come unto him, it says in verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now first I want you to look at, he, he is preaching and teaching. You see that? Now uh, I'm going to run some verses, but I just want you, want you to see the verses. So go there with me. I'll, I'll take them from Matthew and then a couple others in Paul's epistles. And then we're going to turn back and again go to Matthew and a couple of other uh, of Paul's epistles. So first to go to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, you know, you look at something and you just want to see a little bit of clarification, then all of a sudden something jumps out at you. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll point this out to you. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23 
it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Now if he's healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people, that is related to him preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Because he's now not just in the synagogue, he's out in the public and healing all manner of sickness and among the people. But when he's in that synagogue, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. So the teaching took place in the synagogue, and the preaching surely took place more than just the synagogue. It might have took place in the synagogue, but the healing, they didn't have like healing campaigns so much in the synagogue as it was when you read the narratives, he's going different places and the healings take place. And, and during those times, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But did you see that order? Teaching and preaching. Now watch this. Come to chapter 9, verse 35. Chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 35. It says, And Jesus went about all, all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and there it is again, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So you see both listed there, but it all starts out teaching, and it's always associated teaching that goes on in the synagogue. Chapter 11, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, when Jesus made an end of commanding the twelve apostles, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. So in that one, it's just a matter of there is something different about teaching and preaching. But again, I just was surprised the order of that, teach and preach. And then if we just consider what we've studied in the book of Acts, go to Acts chapter 5. And this is after the apostles have been brought before uh, the rulers of Israel, told not to preach anymore in, in the name of Christ. And it says in verse 42, it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and to preach uh, Jesus Christ. So the, they continue the, the teaching and the preaching ministry. We're right here, might as well finish these. Chapter 15 of Acts. Verse 35. I gave you the wrong, oh it is, 15, oh I'm in the wrong place. 1535. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And that's the ministry where Barnabas went and got Saul and Paul and brought him to, uh, to Antioch. Um, am I saying that wrong? I am saying that wrong. This is their return trip and their time they spent there. But the whole thing there, again, you got the teaching and preaching, and you have that order all the way until you come to Acts 28. And then in 28.31 it says, He received all that came to Him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no man forbidding Him. Now, I was surprised that that's the place that it turned around, especially because when I think about it, I always think of the order of preaching and teaching rather than teaching and preaching. But just to kind of talk about a little bit about the difference in that. Preaching is to expound for the purpose of, of persuading drawing the audience to make a decision. And, uh, and really teaching, you're doing the same thing, but when you talk about preaching uh, for the purpose of persuading and drawing an audience to make a decision, uh, it, it's usually associated with the gospel message, making a presentation for them to believe a message, persuade them to put their trust in a message. Now the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus Christ and, them, and, and John the Baptist were preaching is the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that Jesus Christ has come to be their king to fulfill the promises made to Israel. The, the preaching that, uh, of the gospel that the Apostle Paul would preach is the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how you need to trust that as the complete payment of sin to be saved. 
But my point is, is that when you talk about preaching, it's usually associated with the gospel, and, uh, and, and therefore when you go out, you preach the gospel. And I said we're going to re look at those verses, look back again at Matthew chapter uh, 3. It's true in the kingdom program with the gospel of the kingdom, and it's true in the dispensation of grace with the, the gospel of the grace of God. When John the Baptist showed up, it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So as he's addressing an audience there, he's not teaching, he's preaching. And so preaching is to expound for the... To, to, to your audience to, to make them, to persuade them to make a decision. He's calling them to repentance. If you look over in verse 17 of chapter 4 of Matthew, after John goes off the scene, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. So that's why I was saying before there, he's in the synagogue, he does teaching. But when he's in the public, he's preaching. And here the preaching is associated with the gospel of the kingdom, persuading them concerning the good news about the kingdom that Jesus Christ is their king. Now let's go to the other side of Acts. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says in verse 18, well, I'll read verse 17 just so that you realize what Paul's preaching. <laughs> verse 17 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. So i just showing you that the persuasion here of preaching is preaching, like preaching the gospel. You know, sometimes someone will say something at a Bible conference and it'll strike you that you realize that sometimes you don't really use biblical words and maybe you ought to. We always talk about when we go out, we usually say witness. You'll, uh, I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to turn around and say, talk about witnessing again. Uh, our study in the book of Acts from chapter 1 is a witness of someone who saw something. Uh, so that, that like when they were witnesses, they, the Bible says they were witnesses of his resurrection. <laughs> they saw the res resurrected Lord, so they were an eyewitness. And so, but we call sharing the gospel witnessing. Well, that's the other term, sharing. Uh, and uh, one preacher, he really got on a, on a whole congregation one time, you know, share the gospel, share the gospel. <laughs> and he's cutting down the idea of sharing because when you read about it in the Bible, it's preaching the gospel. And, and I had to admit, I, I don't know of any verse that talk about sharing the gospel, do you? But when you read and talk about this, whether it's a personal one-on-one -on -one or whether you're doing it publicly, when you're, <laughs> when you're sharing the gospel, you're actually preaching the gospel because you're, you're, you're presenting it for the purpose of someone to make a decision. And, uh, and, and, the, and when you go through the Bible, the gospel is always preached. And uh, so Paul... Here he's preaching the gospel. Uh, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Verse 18 again, the preaching uh, for the preaching of the cross. The gospel centers around the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. The cross of Christ is the only power on earth to save a soul. There's no other means that a person can get saved. That man that was in the, uh, in the, in the line at the... Uh, uh, post office there and he kept saying all you got to do is repent all you got to do is repent and I said well how about Jesus Christ oh yeah you need him too uh, and and I know this man's doctrine that he he believes in that you do certain works in order to get saved and doesn't believe it all centers in the cross of Christ but a verse like this the cross is the power of God unto salvation well did you were you involved in the cross the only way you get involved is you trust it and then you're actually by the Spirit of God placed into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the, the cross is the work of Christ. And the cross is the power of God unto salvation. There's no power in anything you do to save yourself. The power is in the cross. And that's the only means by which God can save anybody because uh, th there's nothing that you can do that's going to ever satisfy God as a payment for sin. But Christ did. So anyhow, verse 19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to no uh, uh, nothing the understanding of the prudent. 
Now, how is he going to do this? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God. So when the world, they decide they don't believe in God, in God's wisdom, here's what it pleased Him to do. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So you see how the word preaching is associated with the, the message of the gospel and getting people saved. Uh, and this would be the gospel, the grace of God. Now, as I told you, I'm surprised to see different things. So this is just something I just noticed. Don't know if there's any. The last time preaching is found in your Bible is in the book of Titus. Just flip over there. I just thought, oh, that was interesting. It's in verse 3, but I'm going to verse, read verses 1 through 3. Titus chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And then now he addresses Titus. And uh, so the message of, of the, the preaching of how God can save us, the hope of eternal life, is part of the preaching that's committed to the Apostle Paul to make known. He's the one who preached the cross and, and, uh, and, and our, uh, the gospel of our salvation. I, I just pointed out that the word preaching is there. I'm going to do the same thing now on the word teaching. But you see how preaching there is associated with the gospel. So teaching is also, like I said, it is for the sake of persuading people but in doing so, it's more by instruction. Teaching is doctrinal persuasion. And, and I'll, I'll watch these. Come back to Matthew chapter 7. There is a difference between teaching and preaching. Sometimes you mix the two together in the same group. And certainly if you're like in a, in a ministry of a, a Sunday service like we have, or even now that there's an opportunity to do both. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 28, and it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, uh, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and, and not as the scribes. Now we've already seen how when he entered into the synagogue, he, that's, it said he would teach in their synagogues. Well, a synagogue is a place they came together to study. And so he would try to persuade them of doctrinal issues when he's in the synagogue. He'd read the scriptures and, and persuade them doctrinally. So it, it's still persuading, but it's persuading in more of a, the intellectual way or, or through instruction. And, uh, and here they're astonished at his doctrine uh, because he taught them as one having authority. Uh, look over in chapter 15. Here's the negative, by the way, because there's people that teach false doctrine. Matthew chapter 15, and it's talking about the, the Pharisees. And it says uh, in verse 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And uh, so doctrine is the teaching, it's the, the instruction, and, uh, and so they're teaching, what they're teaching, the doctrine that they're teaching was the commandments of men rather than the commandments of God, it didn't come out of the scriptures. So certainly they taught differently than the Lord did, but, but that's, that's what teaching has to do with that persuasion uh, in a doctrinal sense. Um, uh, in Acts chapter 18 we have it. Oh, <laughs> so I'm by showing you four or five, I'm letting you off the hook quite a bit, huh? <laughs> oh, okay. Now, see, you could you could take something like that and look at each one of those, and and certainly it's informative when you do. 
Oh, there. <laughs> no, I didn't even check that. Thanks. <laughs> I was th I was thinking. I don't remember. We talk about sharing the gospel, but I, <laughs> I don't remember a scripture that says that. Acts chapter eighteen. You got all that in your phone? <laughs> Boy, I got to be on the ball these days. <laughs> And this is where Paul's at Corinth, and it says in verse 11, and, and it, he's already gone in, he's preached to the Jews, they reject it, he's turned to the Gentiles, the Lord's telling him that, that everything is going to go to stay there, he's got much people in that city. And so in verse 11 it says, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So when you stay in a place, you do more than just preach, the preaching would certainly be toward lost people, but once you get some people saved, then you teach them, and he's going to spend a year and a half there, so he's going to do some teaching there uh, as well as the preaching when he first came into the city. Um, look at Colossians, and we're on our way to Titus again, but on, on the way, stop at Colossians chapter 1. Now this is Paul talking about his ministry. Um, uh, just, I'll just start in verse 28. It says, speaking about Christ, the last person mentioned in verse 27. It says, whom we preach, he preaches Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom uh, that we may, and again, whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Wherefore I also labor, striving together according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Do you see how the preaching is associating with warning every man? And then the teaching is every man in all wisdom. Uh, so they might present every man perfect in Christ. And so there's the preaching and the teaching, and it looks like preaching toward lost, teaching toward the saved. Um, and, and depending if you're in a teaching environment or in a public preaching forum, so to speak. Uh, then look at Titus, because here's the last time teaching is used. Now when I say teaching, I probably didn't look up teach and all the other ways of saying that, so. But it was interesting here in Titus chapter 2, and look, start in verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So the grace of God that brings salvation, that's what went out and was preached, but it teaches us, those of us who have responded in faith and have been saved by the grace of God, that that same grace teaches us denying ungodliness and worldly lust to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And that's a hard thing to get some people to understand. They think if you tell people that salvation is a free gift by God's grace and all you can do to be saved is just trust the finished work of Christ, well then people are going to go out and live in sin. Well, they would if you never taught them anything. But if they'll learn about the grace of God, the grace of God itself will teach them that not to live that way. That they should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world and <laughs> to be looking for, it doesn't say and there, but looking for that blessed hope. If you're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of, of our God and Savior, Christ Jesus, you're not going to be living <laughs> in, in sin. You're going to be living for him because you're looking for him to come back and uh, and then the reminder in verse 14 of what the gospel is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works so that's the preaching and teaching so go back to Acts 28 now When it says in verse 31, because we, we caught the words preaching and teaching here, but, but watch what it's saying now. It says, he has this 
two years in his own hired house, uh, receiving all that come to him, and in verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So we've already talked about the confidence, no man forbidding him, the, the liberty that he has in that, in that place, even in bonds. But when he preaches, he's preaching the kingdom of God. I've already pointed out to you, preaching is gospel-oriented. And, and just look back at chapter 20, uh, chapter 20 of the book of Acts. We've already talked about the kingdom of God, and there's two aspects of the kingdom of God, God's reign in the heavens, God's reign in the earth. But just to be part of God's eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God is getting saved so that you're a part of eternal life itself. Um, without even studying and learning where your place in eternal life is, just to have eternal life, if he's preaching the kingdom of God, look what he says in Acts 20 and verse 24. And this is where, you know, it's obvious he's going to be bound. But he says in verse 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, notice what his ministry is, to testify... Hey, we don't have share, we got to testify. To testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. So when he talks about going about preaching the kingdom of God, he was testifying the, the gospel of the grace of God. So yeah, when I, I just associate the preaching or the testifying of the gospel, the grace of God, uh, along with the uh, preaching of the kingdom of God in that passage to, to kind of clarify that in chapter 28 verse 31 when he says preaching the kingdom of God if he's receiving all who come unto him that's why I said not everybody coming unto him is a saved person so he has the opportunity that those that will come to him and see him he can preach to them the kingdom of God and, and that's, that's just a basic way of preaching the, saying preach the gospel as it's compared to that verse and then, then you get a little bit more specific and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now everything centers in Christ. The gospel centers in Christ. But a person gets saved and then Paul when he teaches them, he's teaching them things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to get a little bit of a glimpse of that because he's no longer just ministering to the Jews and trying to get them to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's now two years ministering. Anybody who comes they are going to get the gospel. But anybody who's saved, they're going to learn some things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In Paul's epistles, Romans 2, uh, there's Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and Galatians, the first books that are going to, the books that immediately follow the book of Acts. Those books center around the gospel message. They clarify and establish a person in the gospel. So even, even if, there, if you associate that to the preaching of the gospel, but it certainly points out that the gospel centered in Christ. But then when you come to Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, what's called the prison epistles that he wrote while he's there, he writes in there about what God's purpose in grace is all about. And if anything, you understand that God's purpose in grace, even God's purpose in our salvation, centers in God's purpose in Christ. So I want to point out a couple of verses. Look at Ephesians. Um, chapter 4. Uh, I'll skip a whole bunch of things that are said in Ephesians. Go right to chapter 4. Now it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he, how he eventually got the body of Christ started and established so that they don't have to be children anymore. But it talks about in verse 9, there's a little parenthesis here about him coming to earth and then him ascending. It's actually his ascending that I want you to see, but I'll read verse 9. It says, Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Jesus Christ came down to earth, died on the cross, was buried, rose again, ascended back into heaven. But it says, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So you can study this and realize what God's 
God's ministry, how they form the body of Christ, how we have a place in the body of Christ. But when Paul says the things concerning the Lord Jesus, what God's accomplishing center in Christ. <laughs> and that my point in there, how He ascended far above all heavens, that He might fill all things. Everything centered in Jesus Christ. That's why, like, take the book of Colossians. Come over to Colossians chapter 1. Again, it has to do with God forming the body of Christ. And verse 18 is why He formed the body of Christ. And look what it concerns. Colossians 1 verse 18. It says, He, and it's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. See, it's like Paul's preaching the gospel, and certainly that's for people to get saved. But when he teaches, there are the things concerning the Lord Jesus. And the gospel concerns the Lord Jesus, of course. But as he goes on and teaches, everything centers in Christ, God's purpose in Christ. And the very fact that when we get saved, placed into Christ, we become a part of God's purpose. But God's purpose centers in Christ. And so it's a Christ-centered message as he does that. And so when I look at those verses... It's the closing verses of, of, of the book of Acts. As he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, uh, preaching the kingdom of God, certainly that, that reminds me of the truths that are found in Romans through Galatians. And then teaching those things concern the Lord, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that's certainly going to take me through Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. After that comes the, book of, the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And if you know anything about the books of the first and second Thessalonians, they're, they're the books about the coming of Jesus Christ. And as it says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I beseech you that you be not soon shaken in mind, neither troubled or spirit as by... No, no. I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto Him. So you, you got the, the gospel being preached. You got the, everything centered in Christ, God's purpose in Christ. Then you got the book of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is about our gathering unto him. And then after 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, you have 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and Philemon. They're called, usually called pastoral epistles. But what they are is they're about the church and the gathering together. If, if we're going to be gathered together to meet the Lord, what do we do until he comes? Well, we gather together in an assembly. And Paul writes like he does in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. He tells Timothy he wrote these things that he might know how to behave himself in the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so there's this gathering together here in fellowship until we're gathered together with the Lord there. So uh, as, as I just see the, the conclusion of the, of the book of Acts, I see Paul and the progression of his epistles as well. And uh, that's where we leave the book of Acts. Paul with great liberty, and more ministry is going to be conducted, more writing is going to be conducted uh, through people coming and going to him as he's in Rome until he's finally executed there in Rome, probably after a second imprisonment. But we'll study that in another time. So, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that in your grace, that rather than bringing the world to an end, you raised up the Apostle Paul, as the apostle to us Gentiles, preaching the, the good news of the cross of Christ and how salvation is through the work of Christ on his, in, in the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection as the complete payment of our sins. And that, Father, you have brought us into a, a deeper understanding of the mystery of your will, the things that concern Christ and what we're a part of when we're saved and made a part of his body. Father, we pray that we'll be looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. And until then, I pray that we'll gather together and minister one to another in brotherly love. Uh, and so we thank you for the things we've learned and for the study of the book of Acts and for our ongoing study and our ongoing ministry uh, to be carried out until your son returns for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.